This episode is sponsored by viewers like you and Skillshare, which is an online learning platform with classes on all kinds of topics. By clicking the link below, you can get two free months. More on that at the end of the episode. Hey, Cypher here. This one comes by special request, so thanks Nick for making this happen. I gotta say, this is definitely something outside my wheelhouse. If it happened before the 17th century, I'm kinda out of my depth. Luckily, Mary Queen of Scots is a story that's been told basically too often. This rendition is pretty admirable, especially in comparison to others. That being said, because of the amount of times this story has been told, it's fairly difficult to suss out the reality of her biography. Mary Stuart was born at an imperfect time for Scotland. Only a week after her birth in 1542, her father died. She was the sole remaining heir to the throne at a time of war with England, and was of royal lineage for that crown too. A treaty was signed for the infant's future hand in marriage between England and Scotland. But after Henry VIII arrested some merchants, the Scottish Parliament refused to ratify it, igniting another war. Henry sent troops to gain the marriage treaty, but his rough wooing, as it's called, failed after France intervened, cementing their old alliance with Scotland. Instead, Mary I was sent to France to eventually marry the Dauphin. Mary grew up in France while regents controlled Scotland. She was married to the Dauphin, and he eventually became King Francis II, but only for a short while. He died of some head-related disease in 1560, and the dream of uniting the crowns of France, England, and Scotland died with him, rendering Mary a childless widow who only had an accepted claim to the Scottish crown. Equally unlucky was Mary's mother, Mary of Guise, who died during an English siege that same year. Mary had sent a diplomatic mission from France to negotiate a treaty in Edinburgh after her mother's death, but that treaty they created demanded that she renounce her claim to the throne of England. Queen Elizabeth I had just ascended to that throne a couple years prior. Well, Mary Queen of Scots left France while still in mourning for Francis, and returned to take her throne again. First thing on the agenda was dealing with the Scottish Reformation that happened while she was away. Its main leader, John Knox, continuously gave inflammatory sermons denouncing Mary in any way possible. She eventually had him tried for treason, though he got away with it. Scotland was in an odd position. It was only recently reformed, and the Protestants were surly about their Catholic monarch. From this point onward, loyalties were primarily divided by religion, with Elizabeth in the south representing Protestants and Mary being some kind of middle ground. People were constantly afraid that she would impose Bloody Mary's reign of terror on Scotland, though that never came. Instead, everyone resorted to gossip. Almost everything we know about Mary is infused with this court intrigue. That being said, Mary also claimed the English crown. She flirted with those claims, sometimes quite brazenly, but never went far enough to denounce Elizabeth, even though Elizabeth's father's parliament had denounced her in 1533. So there was this dynamic of succession claims and Protestant fear-mongering that made for a pretty volatile mix. What didn't help matters was Mary's decision to wed Lord Darnley, who was technically one of Elizabeth's noblemen, a Catholic, and also related to Henry VII. Basically, he was all the worst fears of the Protestants in Scotland and bolstered Mary's claim to the English throne. Even though Elizabeth had suggested Mary wed an Englishman, she tried to deny the marriage. Many at the time acknowledged a genuine romance between Mary and Darnley, and Mary pushed it through, much to the dismay of Elizabeth and Knox. A rebellion was sponsored by England and whipped up by Knox, but nothing happened after the two armies chased each other about Scotland for a year, literally called the Chase About Raid because of the lack of fighting. Darnley was unhappy being relegated to consort of the Queen, and they became distant rather quickly, despite Mary becoming pregnant. A bunch of noblemen claimed that a court musician had impregnated her and ambushed the musician by the name of Rizzio while he was at Mary's side. He was stabbed numerous times right in front of her. 
This was supposed to be just the beginning as a bunch of the lords conspired to hold Mary prisoner, but she escaped thanks to Darnley coming back to her. They returned to Edinburgh, where she gave birth to the future King James. Darnley became increasingly intransigent, and everyone became embittered by him, including Mary herself. One night, an explosion went off where he was staying, and he was found dead in the garden. Now people blamed Mary as a conspirator to assassinate her own husband. So she was taken from her one-year-old son to Lord Bothwell's castle in Dunbar, never to see James again. Bothwell had his way with her, and they were married quickly thereafter. But this was seen as the last thing to tolerate, and a confederation of lords rebelled against her. The armies met at Carberry Hill, where Mary surrendered. She was taken to an island castle, with her one-year-old son being anointed king, and her bastard brother as regent. She escaped a year later, gathering an army of 6,000 which was defeated at the Battle of Langside by an opposition of only 4,000. Mary fled south to England, hoping Elizabeth would give her shelter. Instead, Mary was imprisoned. English Catholics saw this as an opportunity to oust Elizabeth, so they continuously schemed to bring Mary to the throne of England and give her the ability to seize Scotland, uniting the crowns. It was the convergence of Mary's claims to the English throne and her Catholicism. There was an entire revolt in the north of England, and a civil war continued in Scotland until 1573. Though Mary remained in prison, the plots against Elizabeth never stopped for 18 years, when Mary was finally indicated in one of those plots. Elizabeth signed the order to execute Mary in 1587, who arrived at the chopping block with a red dress symbolizing her martyrdom for Catholicism. She was beheaded, much to the astonishment of European Catholics. Philip II, who reigned over all of this territory, was furious. He'd already dealt with Elizabeth's interference in the Netherlands, so enough was enough. He gathered an armada in 1588 and sent it to conquer England. The Spanish armada failed, and the English returned the favor by sending their own failed armada the following year. Mary may have been dead, but the conflicts in her name remained. Only after Elizabeth's death did they end with the ascension of Mary's son to the English throne, bringing the monarchies under one sovereign, who was James I. What force or guile could not subdue through many warlike ages? Quite a story, right? I don't think anybody can claim the craziness of fighting over thrones. <clears throat> isn't exhilarating. As such, people have been arguing over Mary's story since she was still alive. Almost every aspect has been questioned. Was she an adulteress? A black widow? A fool? A brilliant queen with bad noblemen? Tolerant of Protestantism? A frivolous girl completely out of her depth? A Catholic conspirator? Or all of the above? You can see during the reality section, I chose not to say whether these rumors were true or not. There are books highly critical of Mary Queen of Scots and others that are highly forgiving. The one this movie is based on is of the forgiving sort. Even when looking up academic reviews on this book, they were either super nitpicky or entirely laudatory. So these arguments will remain, but do we really need any more? To me, it all seems played out, just as any great man history, just this time it's about a woman. Similarly to my Darkest Hour review, we just get too many depictions of this particular event. Heck, there was a movie made about Mary's execution in 1896, so this has been in the movies for over a century. These arguments just go in circles and haven't advanced significantly in decades. Some new evidence comes up every once in a while, but the sides have been so entrenched for centuries that they are likely to continue talking past each other. This long historiography gives the movie a lot of room to maneuver. Basically, the filmmakers could pick and choose what side of the story they prefer. This film almost did well by picking its battles. They basically wanted to only focus on Mary's time in Scotland. And that appears great at least until the last 20 minutes. 
The story begins with Mary's return to Scotland, with a great foreboding cut. She had a pretty crazy life, so this film would have benefited with just another 20 minutes or so to flesh out the ending. Until the end, though, wow, they do an incredible job. A lot of the time in the film, it's directly quoting from the huge corpus of letters that Mary and Elizabeth wrote. We shall only do you the favor of betrothing your special friend, Lord Robert Dudley. Once you name us heir. You can tell they put a lot of thought into what to quote and where. Am I to refuse her what I myself suggested? Basically, any time in the first hour and a half of the film that Mary is having some kind of conversation about Elizabeth or vice versa, you can guarantee it's a quote. It's all woven into this drama in a way that simply works. These stories have been perfected over the years, so perhaps that's not as difficult to get right as it would seem. After all, what differentiates this film from the ones that have come before? I think the greatest part is simply the sense of place. I mean, the set design and costumes are one thing which deserves praise for sure. Like, look at the sheer opulence of these shots. But of course, I'm more concerned with narrative, which fares well too. Even the background elements of Mary's life weave in and out of the plot. For instance, we see the other four Marys everywhere she goes, along with the traveling band. Something that irked the more puritanical streak of Knox to no end. Respect not those who flaunt their excesses and who are themselves to wealth and the degradations of the flesh. The whole dynamic of court drama and how it played out on the international scene is pretty easy to grasp. She has outmaneuvered us. Just the feel of everything is quite authentic, with the constant conniving, bickering, infighting, and everything else. Something I have to wonder, though, does it have so many of these minor details that regular audience members will get lost? When I review these things, I research before watching. Most people will never read a book on this subject, and there is so much minutia that it might be easy to get lost. Another side effect is that they may not know where the movie diverges from the truth. They had to compress time a lot in this. How long are you staying? At Hollywood. In Scotland. Are you already planning my departure? The main part of the film takes place between 1560 and 1568, and that was a crazy time. For instance, the confrontation between her and Knox takes quotes from multiple encounters. Well then, I perceive that my subject shall obey you, and not me. And it happens kind of suddenly. That's what I mean by people might get lost without a basic understanding of the story beforehand. And the movie is trying to string it all together in a short period of time. But there are a few odd additions, given how much has to be cut out. First, there's a lot of flirtation with one of the rumors that Rizzio was a homosexual, and that Darnley was secretly in love with him. That's a lot of reliance on an unsubstantiated rumor. Another instance is during the Chaseabout raid, where they add in a battle, despite the whole war being named after its lack of fighting. That was the point. The rebels fled to England. And despite that addition, the actual battles of Carberry and Langside are omitted altogether. The weirdest addition is the last 20 minutes. Movie Mary just suddenly flees to England and has a face-to-face -face meeting with Elizabeth. They never met in reality, though Mary had been trying to arrange a meeting at least until her imprisonment. I guess so many other movies have imposed this inaccuracy that it's to be expected. But really, it serves as another way to rush through the plot and skip everything. As soon as Mary enters England, everything is just wonky and false. If they'd given themselves some more time, we could have seen a climactic battle and a sad escape into imprisonment. No need for this addition. But the end of the movie is rushed. Now, I don't think the end ruins this film. Plus, the story is so laden with mythology that I can't be annoyed by silly attempts at resolving it. 
There's one minor inaccuracy that I have to point out before ending this review though. There's a lot of characters who are portrayed by actors of a race that they certainly weren't in reality. That doesn't bug me, but if we are supposed to take complaints about whitewashing seriously, then those same people ought to denounce this. All of the English and Scottish nobility was what we would call white today. So if you're concerned about whitewashing, it is only fair to criticize this. But to me, I just put this under the costume design category. It doesn't matter for the narrative, so I don't think that criticism is applicable. Okay, with all that being said, it's right on the raggedy edge of acceptable inaccuracy. At least in my consideration, it doesn't reinforce any harmful mythology. So would you like to learn how to retell old stories in new ways? Like this movie is? Well, today's sponsor can help you with that. Skillshare is an online learning platform. There are all kinds of writing courses you can take, and a whole lot more. There's hundreds of classes just waiting for you to click that link below. If creative stuff isn't up your alley, well, everyone could use a little bit of business acumen. And they've got classes on plenty of that stuff too, from marketing to accounting. By clicking that link, you'll get two free months of premium. It's only $10 a month after the two-month trial. So thanks, Skillshare, for sponsoring this episode.